Gil. Uh, Gil. Okay, that was disconcerting. <laughs> uh, Gil is a retired college professor. He, he's, he's the kind of guy who says, don't call me Professor Emeritus. That's way too stuffy. So we won't do that. Uh, he currently lives in Tucson where he's researching Arizona history. Uh, he has, he's working on a book on, uh, yeah, now the name Pump Ellie. Uh, he's done a very good book on uh, Charles Poston. If you folks know Arizona history, you know that Poston calls himself uh, the father of Arizona. Uh, and he is one interesting guy, and you really ought to read Gil's book uh, because he, he he does an awful good good job of talking about it. So with that, here's Gil. Thank you, Doug. I got to share my screen here now. Well, I got my screen. Here we go. Okay. Traveling the Devil's Road. I'm sure we have people watching who know about the Devil's Road, but not so many who know who Charles Poston and Raphael Pumpley were. So let me explain first who these two men were and what they were doing in Arizona and why they had to escape. And then we'll talk about their adventures on the Southern Immigrant Trails. Charles Poston and Raphael Pumpley were both participants in the silver mining boom that took place in Southern Arizona in the late 1850s. Uh, Poston was a co-founder of the Sonora Exploring and Mining Company and superintendent of the company's mines in Southern Arizona. It's, he's arguably the person who started the silver mining boom in, in Arizona in the 1850s. Here are the two uh, principles in our discussion, Charlie Poston on the right, uh, Raphael Pumpley on the, uh, on the left, uh, Raphael Pumpley on the right. Uh, that picture of Raphael was taken when he was a student in Germany and he was only 19 years old, but I love the picture. Um, this is a map um, done by Horace Grosvenor. I'll talk about him in a minute. Uh, it was done in 1861. He called it Silver Mines of Arizona. It actually was kind of a promotional piece for silver mining in Arizona. And it shows the part of Arizona that Raphael and Charles Poston were living and working in. Those of you who are from uh, the Tucson area, this will look very familiar. Here's Tucson up here. Here's the border with Mexico down here. Uh, the dark line in the middle is the Santa Cruz River and the valley. The Sonora Company's uh, most promising mine was over here, the Heinzelman Mine. Uh, and they had a couple of mines uh, down here, down the road in the village of Artavaca. Uh, Poston made his headquarters in the, the uh, deserted Presidio village of Tubac right here. Let me zoom in this so we can get a better look at the middle of the map where all the interesting stuff is. Uh, Raphael Pumpley was a mining engineer for the Santa Rita Mining Company in the Santa Rita Mountains here uh, east of the, the Santa Cruz River. And um, the Santa Rita Company was a subsidiary of the Sonora Company. Horace Grosvenor, who made this map, was a superintendent of the Santa Rita Mines. Um, and their headquarters were here at the Santa Rita Hacienda, right here. So as you can see from this, uh, Raphael and Charles Poston lived and worked pretty near each other. They were all in the same area. They knew each other well, they became friends, even though they were really quite different people. Um, Poston had grown up poor in rural Kentucky he became a lawyer, and in 1850, he went with the gold rush to California and worked as a chief clerk in the Customs House in San Francisco. In 1854, with the backing of some wealthy San Francisco merchants, he led an expedition to Sonora. They were doing land speculation uh, there. When he went to Sonora, he went by boat, but when he came back to California, he came overland and he uh, traveled on the Gila Trail and Cook's Road across the Colorado Desert. So he was a very experienced frontier traveler and he knew about some of the Southern trails before he came to Arizona in 1857 to start silver mining. 
He was charming and articulate. He was an ambitious entrepreneur. He was definitely a risk taker, uh, especially if he thought the risk could make money for him. Uh, Pope Lee came from a wealthy merchant family in upstate New York. From boyhood, he had wanted to be a geologist. He was fascinated with mining. Uh, he graduated from the Royal Mining Academy in Freiburg, Germany, um, in its day, probably the most prestigious mining school in Europe. He was a dedicated scientist. Like Poston, he was adventurous and very personable. He had a wicked sense of humor. He was just 23 when he came to Arizona in October 1860, um, three years after Poston. But unlike Poston, he was a complete tenderfoot. He knew absolutely nothing about life on the Arizona frontier, but he learned. So both Poston and Pumpley were in Arizona to mine silver. Why did they have to leave? The main reasons were raiding Apaches and the US Army's abandonment of Arizona at the start of the Civil War. In midsummer 1861, the Army pulled its troops out of Southern Arizona into New Mexico to fight in the Civil War. And they left the settlers to the mercy of the Apaches. What were the Apaches doing? The Apaches were raiding American settlements in all through this area. Some Apache bands in Arizona raided for subsistence. They'd been doing this in Northern Mexico for over 200 years. Usually they just took livestock, uh, cattle, horses, and mules from uh, the ranches and farms and, and the mines in this area. Even from Fort Buchanan, which is up here, the local army post, they even stole from the army. But as American settlement in Southern Arizona increased through the late 1850s, the Apaches saw the lands that they considered theirs being taken over and their way of life being threatened by the Americans and the raiding turned violent. Um, that's a gross oversimplification of what the Apaches were doing in Arizona in the late 1850s and early 60s. But in the interest of time, it will have to do. Um, this is the Santa Rita Mining Company Hacienda, the headquarters where Rafael Pumpoli lived and worked. It was raided by Apache several times while Rafael was there. So was Poston's headquarters at uh, Tubac and the, Ar and the Aravaca works at the Sonora Company. Um, both Pumpoli and Poston saw the aftermath of other Apache attacks. Uh, in, including the death of Raphael's friend and mentor, Horace Grosvenor, and the killing of four men by Apaches in a raid at the Kanoa Ranch on the Santa Cruz River. After that raid, Pumpley and Poston had to bury the bodies of the men who were killed. Pretty unpleasant work. So both men were being immersed in this violence that was increasing through 1860 and 61. <clears throat> After Horace Grosvenor's death and word that the army was leaving Arizona, Pumpley closed operations here at the headquarters and he and his Mexican workers refined the last bit of silver that they could get from the mines and move the company's property to Tubac, where Poston was, all while under siege by Apaches who had surrounded this hacienda and were attacking um, Rafael and his workers day and night while they worked at their furnaces. And this went on for weeks. It was a grueling ordeal. This is the entry in Rafael Pumpley's notebook uh, for the day that he finally had to leave Santa Rita for the last time. Santa Rita abandoned for want of protection on 15th June, 1861. It's interesting that Pumpley didn't blame the Apaches for this. He blamed the army for deserting the, the settlers and the mines when it was supposed to be their mission to protect them. Four weeks after this, on July 14th, the Kanoa raid happened. Two days after that, John, Post, John Poston, who was Charles's brother, was, and two German workers were murdered at the Heinzelman mine by Sonoran bandits. These killings were what drove uh, Poston and Pumpley from Arizona. Raphael said that the weeks of Apache attacks at Santa Rita, the killings at Kanoa and John Poston's murder had made him very anxious. He'd lost his best friend. Uh, Poston had lost his brother. Um, they'd both seen men killed and, and their bodies mutilated in horrible fashion in some cases. Both men were badly shaken and they weren't alone. Uh, the combination of Apache raiding and the army's departure just terrified and demoralized everyone. Uh, you can tell that from Raphael's journal entry. As a practical matter, unrestrained Apache raiding made mining and ranching in Southern Arizona impossible. 
and the area quickly depopulated. Almost everyone left. Post and Pumpley just joined the exodus. So the two decided to escape to California by a route that they thought would be relatively quick and safe. This is a map um, from uh, Raphael Pumpley's memoir, My Reminiscences, and he marked on it <clears throat> the route that uh, he and Poston took to California, which was not the route that they originally planned. Uh, from Arivaca, let me get my pointer working here, they went in, across the border into Mexico, down this familiar trade route to the town of Caborca, down here. And they had two wagons full of their possessions and a cook, so there were three of them. From Caborca, they had planned to uh, fly, take a boat from Lobos Bay, which is down here. It's off the map. It's on the Gulf of California. And then they would sail to California. They would sail around the tip of Baja and then up the coast of California, probably to San Francisco, I expect, was their, their original destination. But in Caborca, they learned that no boat was coming to Lobos Bay for several months. So they had to change their plans. And they decided to go overland to California um, using the Southern Immigrant Trails. They would go from Caborca down here up this road to Sonoita on the border. Uh, and the Sonoita was the traditional jumping off point for parties going across the desert to the Colorado River. And then they would take this road, El Camino del Diablo, the Devil's Road from Sonoita to Fort Yuma on the Colorado River. And then uh, Cook's Road through the Colorado Desert in California through the coastal Sierras and then up here all the way to Los Angeles, which was their new destination. As you can see, it's a long and very challenging route, a lot of empty desert to cross and high mountains at the end in California. Neither Pumpley nor Poston ever said how long the journey was in miles, but it took them about eight weeks to do it. And it was this time of year between mid-July and mid-September uh, in 1861, 160 years ago. Not a great time to be trekking through the desert. Choosing this route must have been difficult. Let's zoom this and get a little bit better look at the Devil's Road. The Devil's Road had earned its name because of its emptiness. There is nothing out there, no settlements, no place to stop and rest and get food, resupply, um, the lack of water. On, on the trail and the brutally hot temperatures that travelers had to face in summer. Native peoples had used the route centuries earlier to trade with tribes on the Colorado River here and even on the Pacific coast. Um, Father Eusebio Francisco Kino made the first recorded journey along it in 1699 and then three times more in 1700, 1701 and 02. He probably knew the route better than any other European. Father Francisco Garces traveled it in 1771 and then accompanied Juan Bautista de Anza along it on Anza's expeditions from Tubac to California in 1774 and 75. During the gold rush years, thousands followed the Devil's Road to the Colorado River. Many of them died of exhaustion, thirst, and starvation. An estimated 400 died in um, 1849 and 1850, the peak years of the gold rush. And more in the years after that, uh, Pumpley said that a, a party that had recently tried it had to cross a stretch of 120 miles without water and several of them had died. In other words, the, the route was well known and had been used off and on for centuries, but it was still very dangerous. Just traveling the Devil's Road would be tough enough, but in Caborca, a problem came up that would make the trip even more challenging for the Americans. Poston and Pumpley were carrying silver in their wagons from the Arizona mines. Neither of, them, neither of them ever said how much silver they had. I don't think it was very much. Um, but in Caborca, they learned that some men had been walking the streets, boasting openly that they had a gang that was going to attack and rob the Americans, take their silver. So word about the silver had gotten out, and now it would be a magnet for bad guys, of which there were a lot hanging around the border, just waiting for an opportunity like this. Uh, unwary travelers carrying valuable goods and trying to get to the Gulf, trying to get to California, an easy prey for bandits. 
So Poston and Pumpley wanted to get out of Caborca as quickly as they could, but they had to protect themselves. Friends in Caborca told them to increase the size of their party. So they took on another American, a fellow named Williams, who said he was a Californian, one of a group of prospectors who traveled to the west coast of Mexico by boat, but they shipwrecked on Lobos Bay. Williams had been uh, rescued and brought to Caborca, and now he wanted to go home to California. He seemed friendly and reliable, and since they needed more guns in their party, Pumpley and Poston invited Williams to come with them. And they even outfitted him with a horse, a saddle, and a rifle and pistol, all at their own expense. Well, the Americans took the road north from Caborca, uh, headed for Sonoida, and they went to first to the small village of Kitovac, but just north of Kitovac, the road divided. And in the right fork, they saw the tracks of the men who were intending to rob them. They were headed for Sonoida, which is exactly where Poston and Pumpley had wanted to go. So the Americans detoured. They took the left fork, also north to the tiny village of San Domingo on the border. You can see it right here, just a few miles west of Sonoida. And there they met a man named Remigio Rivera. He was a Sonoran military officer, uh, a general who had recently taken part in a revolution against Sonoran governor Ignacio Pesquiero. They tried to overthrow him. And the revolutionaries actually had been in the Santa Cruz Valley the year before, in 1860. Um, they'd been up here and uh, provisioning and planning uh, an invasion of Sonora to attack Pesquiero's forces. And the rebels did invade Sonora. Um, and uh, Remigio Rivera, led one of their columns, but the revolution failed, it collapsed, and Rivera now had withdrawn with some of his troops to Sonoida on the border where he could easily cross over into the United States if Pesquero's forces came after him. And he was waiting there uh, to, until he figured out what to do next. He was in a kind of strange political and military limbo. As it happened, Pumpley and Poston knew Rivera quite well. Um, he'd visited Santa Rita and Tubac many times when he'd been in Arizona the year before. And now the Americans' hospitality toward Rivera helped to save their lives. Rivera told them that the men who had threatened them in Caborca were actually former rebel soldiers who had been under his command. They did intend to rob the Americans and they were waiting for them now in uh, Sonoida. So the decision not to go there had been a smart one. He wanted to help the Americans, and so he now personally guided them to the last spring that they would find before they had to cross the desert. And near the spring, Pumpley and Poston found two more Americans who were going to California. So they now had a party of six armed men, and they were confident that they could fight off any bandits who might mountains. But before spring, and now they were in danger of dying, they camped on the edge of a, a huge ancient lake bed, now all dried up and covered in dried, cracked mud. During the night, a monsoon thunderstorm filled the lake with a sheet of water just a few inches deep but it extended for miles and it, it gave them all the water they needed. It saved their lives. During their time on the Devil's Road, Poston and Pumpley endured temperatures up to 130 degrees. Pumpley had a thermometer and he was taking readings. They also saw the bones and the mummified carcasses of many animals that had died in the desert, cattle, horses, and mules. Um, the air was so hot and so dry that when animals died, they, their bodies wouldn't necessarily decompose, they might just mummify. They were traveling mostly at night now and, and trying to rest during the day, trying to find shade if they could, there wasn't much. One brightly moonlit night, they saw strange forms in the distance on the road ahead of them, couldn't quite make them out. And as they got nearer, they saw on both sides of the trail, rows of mummified cattle, horses and sheep standing up and facing the trail. Um, it was a bizarre uh, sight, eerie, especially in the moonlight. Pumpley said they must have been put there by travelers with a sense of humor. 
um, the party moved on to the Tinajas Altas, uh, the high tanks, which consisted of a series of rock pools, one above the other. This is a photograph of uh, some of the upper tanks at Tinajas Altas. You can see how high up they are. These rock pools would fill with water whenever it rained. <clears throat> but when rain didn't fall, the lower tanks would dry up and travelers who wanted water would have to climb up to these higher ones uh, to find water. If they wanted to water their animals, they would have to bail water from these uh, higher tanks to the next lower one and the next lower one until they could get enough water in the lowest tank that animals could drink. Travelers had to climb up to these high tanks and were already weak from starvation and thirst would sometimes fall to their deaths. You can see how far down it is to the bottom. Well, Pumpley and Poston managed to elude the robbers. They never did see them after Caborca. But Pumpley had a nagging suspicion that Williams was not what he pretended to be. One, on one night ride, he coaxed Williams into lagging behind the group, along with him, the two of them together. And he plied Williams with some Spanish brandy that they had in their supplies and got him to admit that at a, on a previous trip along this trail, the Devil's Road, he had killed a man named Charlie Johnson in a quarrel over a woman. As he drank some more brandy, Williams further confessed that he'd been part of a gang of outlaws, one of the most notorious in California in the gold rush days. Eight years before, they'd been given shelter at a mission near Caborca by a priest and his sister. And in return for this kindness, the Americans had hanged the priest, stole several thousand dollars in gold objects from the church, and then rode through Caborca using the priest's robes as saddle blankets. Finally, uh, after some more brandy, Williams said that he was wanted in San Francisco for having killed a man there. And Pumpley said he only knew one bad man that he'd met in Arizona who deserved hanging more than Williams whom they'd taken with them, ironically, to increase their safety. They'd been running from Apaches and then from bandits, and now they took on this murderer. Um, he said that when Williams realized that Pumpley knew about the gang, Pumpley had heard stories about this gang. And as soon as Williams started talking about them, he recognized immediately who the gang was, and he understood now who Williams really was. And he said, as soon as Williams saw this, Williams made a move for his pistol. But he stopped when he saw that Pumpley already had a hand on his own gun. Raphael wasn't a tenderfoot anymore, fortunately for him, or he might have been left out in the desert along with Charlie Johnson. Pumpley chose to tell only Poston what he learned, probably because they still needed Williams for the party's security. But he said that he slept lightly and with his pistol in hand whenever it was Williams' turn to stand watch. And the least sound made him cock the weapon. One night he woke to realize that he'd been sleeping with his finger on the trigger of a cocked pistol. Pretty dangerous. Despite Pumpley's fears, a day after leaving the Tinajas, they reached the Gila River. Without incident, Williams didn't try anything. And they arrived at Fort Yuma on the Colorado the next day. And a few days later, they took the ferry across the Colorado and camped at an abandoned Overland Mail Station. This is John Ross Brown's sketch of Fort Yuma on the Colorado in 1864, three years after Raphael and Poston had been there. And if you look here, you can see the ferry right here on the California side and Fort Yuma on the bluff up above. Soon after they crossed, uh, an old friend of Williams, an evil looking character named One-Eyed Jack, showed up at the ferry and he and Williams spent a day together. Pumpley and Poston were sure that the two planned to murder them and take their silver. So the next morning, Poston got the drop on Williams and ran him out of camp at gunpoint. And he said, Pumpley and I have concluded that it wouldn't be safe for you to go to California. Uh, the last man you killed hasn't been dead long enough and they have a way there of hanging men like you. He said, Williams laughed and stuck his hand out and said, give us your hand. You're sharper by a damn sight than I thought you was. You'll do for the border. And it was a compliment from a murderer. He was saying, you're smart enough and tough enough now to survive on the border. You might even be able to be one of us, border outlaws. Then he jumped into his saddle and waved his hat and rode off. And they never saw him again. 
I'm sure they were happy about that. It was now early September. They'd been on the trail almost two months and Pumpley and Poston had to cross the Colorado desert, uh, a region that Poston probably remembered well from his 1854 expedition because he had to cross it then. Let's zoom this so we can get a little better look at the Colorado desert and Cook's Road. Uh, the route that Poston and Pumpley took was a well-established one by 1861. It went from Fort Yuma, dipped below the border here, and then north again, across a sand desert, another dry lake bed right here, past Wells and through the um, coastal Sierras here at Carrizo Canyon, and then uh, into the valley beyond and on up to Los Angeles. Anza and Father Garces had used a version of this route on their California expeditions. It was later used by uh, Brigadier General Stephen Watts Carney and Lieutenant Philip St. George Cook leading military expeditions to California in 1846 and 47. Um, Cook, of course, leading the Mormon Battalion. Uh, I'm sure some of you know that Cook's mission had been to create a military road to the Pacific. And so the route was known as Cook's Road. It was traveled by tens of thousands of California immigrants in the gold rush years. Um, the Butterfield Overland Mail used Cook's Road and built stations on it, uh, though in 1861, these stations were closed. So like the Devil's Road, the route across the Colorado desert was well known, but it was considered by travelers to be even more dangerous than the Devil's Road. And for the same reasons, the hostile terrain, the heat, the lack of water, it was also longer than the Devil's Road. Well, there are only three of them now, Post and Pumpley and their cook. Um, they chased Williams away, and the two Americans they picked up near San Domingo had left to go their own way. Uh, Pumpley says that from the Yuma crossing, they had to traverse the worst of deserts. Um, crossing another dry lake bed, we saw that on the map, and then dunes of constantly shifting sand that other travelers said moved like the waves of the sea. This was a landscape that would change its appearance in, in hours, uh, obliterate trails and cover up wells. They found wells that Pumpley said had been dug by the Overland Mail, but the water in them was alkaline and they were afraid to drink it. Pumpley doesn't say, but these probably were Sackett's wells. They're marked on his map um, at where the Overland Mail built a station in 1858, which maybe was, uh, is what made him think that the Overland Mail dug the wells. Sackett's wells were a, a familiar stopping place on Cook's Road, and, and the wells were much older than the, the Overland Mail station. Uh, Anza had camped near them in 1774. John Russell Bartlett stopped there in 1852 and had to dig down six feet to get to water. From the wells, Poston and Pumpley went north through the heart of the desert, uh, today California's Imperial Valley, where the heat and violent sandstorms had killed many men and animals. And as on the Devil's Road, they saw the bones of animals um, that had died along the trail. They passed through the mountains by the way of Carrizo Canyon, pushing their animals through the canyon and on through the heavy sand of the Carrizo Wash Beyond it, many travelers complained about the sands of the Carrizo Wash and how difficult it was to get through them. Once again, they were traveling at night to try to escape the heat, trying to get off the desert as quickly as possible. Um, but Pumpley said the desert seemed to be pursuing them. He said that all night long as they were pushing their way through the canyon and the sands of the wash, they saw animal skeletons glittering in the moonlight and felt hot blasts of air rushing up from the desert behind them. He said it was like walking through the valley of the shadow of death and flying from the gates of hell. Beyond the Carrizo Wash, they crossed the summit of the mountains and felt a breeze from the ocean. The trail now descended and they came to a field of watermelons and then saw herds of cattle and live oak trees. Pumpley said it seemed impossible that they they now were in this beautiful fertile valley and not long ago they were dragging themselves through that hellish desert landscape with the hot, hot winds and the sand and the skeletons flying from the gates of hell. And now they followed a road north to Los Angeles through the cattle ranches and vineyards of Southern California. But Raphael didn't think that they were out of danger yet. 
The Civil War was well underway in the East. And Popoli said that almost the entire Anglo population of Southern California was from the Southern states. And, he, and they hated the North so much, he said that he felt the Northerner there was in as much danger as in the heart of the Confederacy. But they had no problems with the locals and they reached Los Angeles safely. From there, they took a coastal steamer to San Francisco and their journey was over. So what happened to these two after they got to San Francisco? Both had very interesting lives and both returned to Arizona later in life. Charles D. Poston went to Washington, D.C. and lobbied for passage of the act to make Arizona a U.S. territory. He lobbied President Lincoln in the White House and he was successful. Probably reminded Lincoln that they were both Kentucky boys. Lincoln signed the Arizona Territorial Act into law at the end of 1863. Poston was appointed Arizona's first superintendent of Indian affairs, and he went back to Arizona to take up his duties. He later was elected Arizona's first territorial delegate to Congress. He served a term and then practiced law in Washington, D.C. after that. He toured Asia on a diplomatic appointment, traveled in the Middle East and Europe, and lived in London for six years. He came back to the States and to Arizona in 1876, but his fortunes declined after that. Uh, he managed to subsist on a series of low-level political patronage jobs and <clears throat> by writing about his frontier experiences for the newspapers and magazines. He died in Phoenix in 1902. He was 77 years old and he was indigent. He was in abject poverty. From San Francisco in 1861, Raphael Pumpoli sailed to Asia and served as a consulting geologist and mining expert for the Japanese and Chinese governments. When he returned to the States, he taught geology and mining engineering at Harvard. He took part in several state and US geologic surveys and conducted geoarchaeological research in Central Asia. He published numerous scientific articles and papers, chapters in books, four books on geological topics and four books of reminiscences about his life and travels. Uh, he had become an internationally known and respected geologist. In March 1915, at age 78, Pumpoli also returned to Arizona with his two adult daughters, his son and daughter-in-law. It was an attempt to seek what he called the healing influence of the desert after his wife's death that same year and to take his children to see the scenes of his youthful adventures. He took his family into the Santa Rita Mountains, but unlike the old days, they traveled in three Ford cars with drivers, a party of eight in all. Uh, Rafael made a, an emotional return to the deserted Santa Rita Hacienda, and while much had changed there, he still was able to see the ruins of his old furnaces where he and his Mexican workers had labored day and night to process the last of that Santa Rita silver while the bullets and the arrows of Apaches flew over their heads. This is a, a photograph that Rafael took himself of his old furnace complex at Santa Rita. A Mexican who lived on the property found Horace Grosvenor's grave, now all covered in brush, but he cleared it. In 1861, Pumpley had carved a stone to put over the grave. In 1915, the stone was still there and the inscription as clear as the day Raphael had carved it. And this is a photograph of Raphael standing at the grave of Horace Grosvenor, his, his good friend and mentor when he had lived in Arizona. But as you can perhaps tell from the photograph, the visit to Santa Rita was not a happy one. Pumpley found it emotionally overwhelming. Um, the feelings of anxiety and despair he had known in the old days swept over him again. And staring at Grosvenor's tombstone, he said he felt the curtain was again rising on the dark drama of 1861, and that day by day memory would reenact the tragedies of those days. He escaped from his distress by trying to repeat his and Poston's flight from Arizona in 1861, but this time with his family in their cars. This is not one of the Pumpley's cars, but it's the right model and the right vintage Model T Ford touring car, 1912. Unlike in 1861, they wouldn't have to deal with robbers or murderers or renegade Sonoran revolutionaries. 
but they still have to face the brutal landscape and the heat and the lack of water. And they'd have to cross terrain not made for cars. The desert hadn't gotten any easier to travel in since 1861. The Pumbleys planned to go west from Tucson, aiming for a point 100 miles away on the Mexican border, where they would pick up the Devil's Road. And then they'd follow it 150 miles to Yuma. Their blankets were wrapped in canvas rolls and lashed to the automobile hoods, cans of gasoline and boxes of food and cooking gear were strapped to the running boards and canvas bags of water were hanging off the sides of the cars. It's just remarkable that Raphael still had an appetite for this sort of thing at age 78 and knowing what the devil's road was, he still was willing to try it. From Tucson, they started west across the Babo Kivari Plain on their first day, their, their head driver gave, gave away some of their gas to a man who said he needed it and who assured them that they could get gas at a place called Indian Oasis. But there was no gas at Indian Oasis, which meant that they had to detour away from the border to Ajo, site of the famous copper mines, to get gas. Here's a photo of the copper mines at Ajo in 1917, two years after the Pumpleys were there. Pumpley later considered this detour lucky since he found that Ajo the only person in the vicinity who had been to the Tinajas Altas and could guide them there. It was an 85 year old Pima Indian named Tomaso. And at the Tinajas, they would find water, they hoped, uh, without having to climb up to the highest tanks and they would follow the Devil's Road to Yuma. But they had to have a guide because when they got to the Devil's Road, they'd have to be able to find water quickly in order to survive. Well, their first day out from Ajo, the Pumpley stopped at a well where they planned to fill their water bags. Their driver said the water was bad, and, uh, but that they could make it to the next water without refilling. However, they soon came to an area of soft sand where they had to get out and walk so that the cars could be driven over the sand without sinking into it. This doesn't look good. Uh, <laughs> Their water was getting low in their water bags and in the radiators of their cars. It was 1861 all over again. Finally, they came to a channel. Um, they had came to a place where the water had cut channels in the sand with banks up to a foot high on either side, and they had to get out and push the cars over the banks. Finally, they came to a channel whose far bank was too high to push the cars over and Puffley got out a large piece of canvas that he brought to spread over them at night in case it rained. And they stretched the canvas over the bank and it gave the cars enough traction that they could be driven over the bank and onto the hard packed sand beyond. And when they did that, they found themselves on the dry lake bed that Puffley and Poston had crossed in 1861 and where a sudden downpour had saved their lives. And they had found the Devil's Road. So they knew where they were. They camped near the Pinacate lava fields. Uh, this was a region of ancient lava flows from extinct volcanoes in northwestern Sonora that extended north into Arizona. And Pumpley said that what they saw was two parallel rows of fantastic looking lava cones, 200 to 300 feet high. Father Salvatierra, Juan Salvatierra had seen these lava flows with Kino in 1701. And he said they looked as though someone had poured pitch over the landscape and it had adhered to all the rocks and the rough surfaces. Uh, Father Salvatierra was sure that this is how the world would look after the great conflagration on the judgment day when God would send fire to destroy the earth. Well, the Pumpleys found the Tinajas Altas and there was water in the tanks. They were looking down from the higher tanks here again. At the, here's the Devil's Road down here. Pretty awful looking landscape. And they went on to Yuma where their desert journey ended. They then returned home to Dublin, New Hampshire where Raphael died eight years later in 1923 at the age of 85. So Charles Poston and Raphael Pumpley, these are two photographs of them in old age, um, they met very different ends, but both were genuine frontier people, uh, adventurous, ambitious, uh, resourceful, not always, not always wise decision makers, 
and they weren't immune to the danger of the uh, immigrant trails. But their stories certainly help us understand what traveling on those trails was really like in 1861 and in 1915. And they tell us a lot too about the unique nature of the frontier experience. That is my talk. Thank you very much for listening. I'll be glad to answer questions if anyone has any. And if you can uh, stop your screen share, then- oh, my screen share. Okay, there we are. Yeah, feel free anyone to unmute yourself and chime in and ask questions. Um, and if you can't unmute yourself, you can raise your hand and I'll unmute you. I want to say that was absolutely excellent. I learned a lot. Thank you, Doug. Uh, and one thing that it occurred to me that, that you may want, may not have run into, was that total confusion of the early months of, of 1861 when a democratic administration was going out in Washington and wasn't issuing orders to anybody because nobody wanted to start the war, right? And, which really didn't start until July at Bull Run. And the army uh, in February from Santa Fe issued orders, cease patrolling. We're gonna have a big campaign against the Apache and it never came. Yeah. And that's why a lot of the settlers were so upset. Here's this army sitting there doing nothing. Yeah, you, you read that often in, in settlers' accounts and letters and things like that. They were almost all the settlers were really annoyed with the army and the stuff. They, they weren't helping them, they weren't protecting them. And now they were leaving, you know, to, to, to make things even worse. So we have a question from Jan. Uh, was Poston, Arizona named after Poston? Um, probably, I don't know if Post in Arizona, but it, it probably was named after him. It's, where is where is Post in Arizona? Park. I'm trying to. We can hear you, Jan. Oh, you can. Okay, thank you. It's south of Parker, Arizona. That's where I was raised. Is it near Apache Junction? Hmm. I don't know. No. Poston no. is Poston's buried at Apache Junction, near Apache Junction. Okay, well, Post. I would say, say about 20 miles south. Okay. South of Parker. Yeah, it's it's about 20 miles south of Parker, Arizona, off the Colorado River. So yeah. there's a place there called Poston, Arizona. Yeah. And that's where um uh Japanese were raised. Many Japanese families, Japanese American families, were interned there in three different camps in Poston, Arizona. So, you know, I'm like, okay, so maybe Poston was named after Poston. Oh, he, he lived and worked in Florence for a while. He was uh -huh. uh, part of the government land office in Florence. It was one of the political patronage jobs that, that he had. And uh, then he lived in Phoenix. So I think he actually was in Tucson for a while, but he ended up in Phoenix. So, well, you know, it's an interesting name there that somebody yeah. coming through there and, and there's a post in Arizona. Right. So just wondering. Good, good question. John. I'll unmute you. There you go. There I go, okay. Hi. Hi. Man, anyway, uh, I am fascinated by that map of New Mexico behind you on the wall. What is the age of that? Uh, the colored one is 1861. They're both of New Mexico territory. Yeah. The colored one is 1861. The other one, this one here is 1862. 1862 and both, both, when yeah. Southern strip of Arizona was a part of the Confederacy. Yes, yeah, yeah. But these are both before the Arizona Territorial Act, so they're New Mexico Territory. When Territory. you refer to the Territorial Act, are you talking about something else besides the uh, the act that Lincoln signed in February of 1863, which separated Arizona from New Mexico Territory? That one. 
Yeah, yeah, that act. But Arizona became a separate territory from New Mexico. Yeah, well, that was in February of mm -hmm. 1863. Right, right. Okay. So I think I said the end of 63. That's wrong. I misspoke. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry if I confused you. <laughs> Well, if you ever get up to uh, Prescott, I've got some groups of historians around here that would love to hear that talk. Oh, cool. Well, you're going to have uh, uh, the Prescott uh, Corral of the Westerners Symposium up there. Is it, is it later this month? I don't remember. It's in November. November. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I spoke there um, a couple of years ago. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Good. I have your email address. Good. <laughs> Let me know. Other questions? Isabel, can I share my screen again and show some resources? Sure. Okay, let me try. Uh, if any of you are um, interested in reading more about uh, Poston's and Pumpley's experiences in Arizona in their own words, you might want to look at these books, Charles Poston's uh, Building a State in Apache Land. It's a compilation of four articles that he wrote in that last part of his life of 1894, I think, for the Oberlin Monthly Magazine. Pretty interesting. Um, and then Raphael Pumpley's Across America and Asia, and My Reminiscence is the two-volume autobiography, which were the sources mostly for this talk. Um, Poston didn't say much about the escape to California. He, he referred to it and then said, if you want more information about this, read Professor Pumpley's book, <laughs> Across America and Asia. So that was, um, that was it. And oh, who put this slide in here? Uh, these are my books, Reconnaissance and Sonora, if you want to um, find out more about uh, Charlie Poston's 1854 uh, expedition into Sonora and Raphael Pumpley's Arizona, we hope will be out in uh, December. Should be able to get them both on Amazon. Uh, hope so, anyway. So that's my commercial. And I can send those out in an email okay. yeah, if okay. that is helpful for people. And did you have that your would be I just wanted to thank Gil for all the work that he's put into this. All those details, um, all that sand. <laughs> I just feel downright gritty. I know. So um, I. Uh, I, it, I, I sometimes, you know, I was doing this, I'm thinking about those guys out there at this time of year um, yeah. you know, on the Devil's Road and also in uh, the Colorado desert. I think, God, they must have been desperate to get out of there. Um, there, I'm, I could go on here for another half hour. There were some other reasons why they would want to get out of Caborca and not stay there. Um, uh, but uh, it was a rough trip. And they were lucky to get out alive, which makes it even more amazing that Raphael wanted to go back there in 1915. Uh, you have to think a little bit about what some of his motives might have been. Interesting. Well, I can certainly recommend uh, the uh, Reconnaissance in Sonora that you wrote as an excellent book. Thank you, Doug. And uh, I'll be looking for the book on Pompelli. So will I. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure. Enjoyed it. Great to see you all. Let's do it again. Stay safe. Stay off the devil's road. <laughs> well, I did owe everybody. Thank you very much. Great presentation and learning a little bit more about the history. And Doug said, Doug said this would be good. Thank you, Doug. <clears throat> we need to have another Southern Trails Symposium down in Tubac. We had one many years ago. That would be a great location. Absolutely a great location. Fascinating place. You can see Charles Poston's house there. It's a B&B &B now. You can stay overnight there. Mm -hmm. <laughs>